Hey, what's up, everybody? BDO44 coming at you with another video. All right, game three, NBA Finals. Series switches back to Boston. Golden State has tied the series up in game two. Um, essentially, what we saw in game two was a Golden State team who put more of an emphasis on defense than, than they had in the first game, at least. I'll say that. 15 steals, uh, 19 turnovers for the Boston Celtics in total. That is definitely a recipe for the Celtics to lose. I was listening to Brian Windhorst. He brought up, I think, maybe the most key of all the key stats there is in regards to this series, which is if the Boston Celtics score more than 15 or accredit themselves 15 or more turnovers, they lose. If it's below that, I believe it is, they're 5-0. and I think that's how that stat went. Needless to say, the Boston Celtics need to stop turning the ball over. Period. Like, it's just... That is a focal point of the highest order. Um, problem is they're going up against a very, very good Golden State defense, and Golden State is going to have plenty to say about that, especially since GP2 is now back and active. Uh, he made a big impact on that game. Um, he was all over the place, hit a three-point shot, did some defensive things, shut some people down in the way that he does with the time given, and I think that you're going to see more of GP2, of whom I believe is the Marcus Smart of the Golden State Warriors. <clears throat> now, Clay Thompson's. Shooting woes have been extensive. We've talked a lot about those. He looked about as bad as he's looked ever in game two. This is the NBA Finals. And I don't, <clears throat> I do not like that the Golden State Warriors are just relying upon things that have to do with faith and mantra rather than the reality of the circumstances in front of them and the times they're in. That is the problem I have with Steve Kerr's approach to these finals in the first two games. In the first game, he played Andre Iguodala coming off an injury that hasn't had him out there in two months. There was no part of what makes sense logically that would tell you you need to play Iguodala in these finals. The only reason why you play Iguodala in these finals is because you're feeling nostalgic and you remember what he did for you in the past and you trust him. The problem with trusting him is it's not his mind that you need to have faith in. It's the body. And this is where I always go left with situations like these. I don't have a problem with Andre Iguodala's basketball acumen. At this point, I would trust him to be an assistant coach with, coach with the Lakers. We could hire him as an assistant coach. I'll smile about it and congratulate him and be happy about it. That's where he's at in his career. But to have him go out there and try to play basketball against a young Celtics team that specializes in defense when we know he doesn't stretch the floor, when we know he's a step slow because of the injury and his age, that was a poor decision. You know, this is a poor decision. Iguodala wasn't available for game two, so there was no way to play him. You replace him with GP2, and suddenly you look a lot better. Otto Porter Jr. has not gotten enough attention from Steve Kerr in this series. He's having an excellent finals to start these first two games, and because he's had so much focus on playing Klay Thompson, bringing in Iggy, trying to work certain things into the equation, he's, he's not realizing at all that he has a literal hot hand on his bench that he's just not using as much as he needs to. The guy is hot. He's playing great on both sides of the floor, and believe it or not, he's had a good playoffs. All playoffs long, Otto Porter Jr. has been one of the most important players on the Golden State Warriors bench. And he has, because he plays a small forward position and because they have so many other guys, including the two that I just talked about, at that position, it's almost like you forget about him. But the problem is, forgetting about him does you no favors because he's one of your best defensive players. Right, He's hitting shots. He's doing what he needs to do. And he's one of your best rebounders as to which you, Golden State Warriors, are at your best, as we've talked about many times on this channel, when you rebound the basketball. That is what he does from his position very well. I looked at the stats, and the players who had the best plus and minus for the Golden State Warriors were their best defenders. It was Kevon Looney. I believe it was Andrew Wiggins. Otto Porter Jr., Gary Payton II and Steph Curry. I, those are the guys that, if I'm not mistaken, they had the best plus minus. I don't think Trey Draymond was in there, but he did have a good plus minus. But the point was, they got their most damage when they put those defensive players on the floor and stopped the, the Boston Celtics from scoring. Because the Boston Celtics are going to defend against whatever offensive talent you have on the floor. The only person who's able to bust up that defense for the Golden State Warriors consistently has been Steph Curry. They, they have not had a good uh, good tenure trying to guard him in these first two games that Boston have. Steph is doing what he wants to do. He's having a very good series. 
they need to continue to use him and put more of an emphasis on those meat and potato guys that I just mentioned <clears throat> that play excellent defense and rebound the ball. Because what they are doing is they're relying upon the rah-rah stuff. Oh, let's bring in, oh, we got uh, Clay Thompson. Let's bring him in. Yeah, yeah, Clay's going 100. He's, he's shot 100 shots, only hit 10 of them, but he's Clay, so we're going to roll with that. That's our mantra. We, we do that. Yes. Okay, uh, let's bring in Iguodala. He won a, 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 a finals MVP three years ago or 10 years ago, whatever, 15 years ago. So let's bring him in and we can play, trust him in the finals. It's like, come on, bro. That's nonsense. Did you not just watch the Lakers? We did that with our entire team and our entire roster, and we were miserably bad. Fans were unhappy on top of it. You're in the finals, man. You got the championship on the line. You're going up against a team that has won 17 NBA championships. You can't look at them at all historically and say they can't overcome the impossible because they've been doing it for almost 100 years. Knocking off a, a Golden State Warrior team that is a dynasty but hasn't been a winning team in a couple years isn't far-fetched at all. It ain't far-fetched. For them historically as a franchise. So if you want to talk about mantras and you want to put stuff out there that's fluff, you do understand you're going up against Lucky, right? Right? Since since we're going to talk about stuff that has nothing to do with basketball, we're going to hang our hat on stuff that's fluff. You do understand you're going up against the second greatest franchise in the history of the sport. Because I know it's us. The Lakers are number one. I know that. But nevertheless, the Golden State Warriors need to get back to basketball. Because the Boston Celtics ain't thinking about banners as it pertains to what the past is. No, they're trying to win right now. They're not thinking about what they've done and who they've been. They're not, they're not calling up Larry Bird trying to see if he wants to walk through the door today. You know what I'm saying? They're not going to grab Paul Pierce, see if he wants to play tonight. No. It's 2022. You got to do things the right way. You got to do things that work for today. You know what I'm saying? Y'all sitting up here want to play with Andre Iguodala? Why stop there? Call Monte Ellis. See if he want to play. Anybody got Rick Barry's number? Since y'all want to do that. You feel me? So that's what I wanted to get on here and just say, stop it, Golden State. You have the horses to compete with the Boston Celtics. You've tied this series up. Stop the rah-rah. I want to be like the Lakers, so we're going to do things that have nothing to do with basketball because we believe in our mantra and all this. Stop that. Stop that. No, stop that. Burn you some sage, say a couple prayers, and knock that nonsense off. Get them curses off you. You don't need that. What you need to do is play Andrew Wiggins, <laughs> Kavon Looney, Otto Porter Jr. and the guys who are really doing it. <laughs> because that's going to get you the championship. That rah rah stuff is going to make Lucky the champion. Simple as that. So that's what I wanted to say. That's the first major point I wanted to get out the way. Stop that Golden State. You're lucky to have won a game in this series doing that nonsense. Stop it. Clay Thompson, he needs to be managed better. You got away with him shooting four for what, 19? His shot selection was worse than his misses. The fact that he missed those shots weren't as bad as the shots he actually chose to attempt. This is in his head, and he needs to be managed. There is no ifs, ands, or maybes about it. Klay Thompson is a player right now who is hurting his basketball team. And he know it. And it's up to his coach to do the difficult thing so that he can walk away a champion. Simple as that. So I'll tell you right now, Klay Thompson is not a guy, in my opinion, who has to be the guy. He's not tripping like that. I think he knows he's struggling, and I think he knows that it would be in the coach's best interest to kind of reel him in. Now, he's not going to tell you that because he's a champion with a lot of pride. But I'm telling you, if he were a coach and a guy's going four for 19, I'm pretty sure he manages him differently. Steve Kerr, you got to manage him differently, bro, or he's going to lose the championship and blame himself. We know how this goes. He's going to blame himself. And it ain't his fault. Because it's not his job to keep him in the game or take him out the game. You understand what I'm saying? That's Steve's job. And Steve needs to do that job. You got plenty of players at that position that are helping you in these finals right now. Play them more than the guy who's not able to. And you will be happier with your results. It is that simple. This is not about disrespecting Klay Thompson in any way. I'm trying to help him get a championship. And what I'm telling you is, if he has another 4 for 19 game, he's going to lose tonight. Ain't going to be no room for it. You're in Boston. This is their home floor. Jason Tatum is finding his rhythm, even though he's wildly inconsistent. And in the games where he didn't shoot well, the game he didn't shoot well in this series, he got 13 assists. I hate to tell you this, but he's having a bad, good series. 
Yes, Jason Tatum is having a bad, good series. And what does that mean? That means in the midst of his struggles, he's doing things to help his team. In the midst of finding himself turning the ball over and bricking shots, he's finding ways to elevate his assists. He's finding ways of being more effective defensively. He's helping himself no matter what. So that is the recipe for Jason Tatum that I like. Jalen Brown doing well as well, continuing to drive into the paint. I think the defense is being a little more effective against him in terms of what he does. Now that GP2 is back, I think that's going to affect him <clears throat> a lot. I think Andrew Wiggins has done a fantastic job on both of those guys. And <clears throat> excuse me, they're going to need to continue to contain Jalen Brown. They don't need Jalen Brown going home and then having a 30-point, 35-point game. And listen, I'm going to tell you all the truth. Jalen Brown is due for that kind of game. He ain't had a game like that in these playoffs. He's had good games. But I don't think I've seen a game where Jalen Brown was like, all right, that's Jalen Brown. Now we know it. I haven't seen that game in the playoffs at all. <clears throat> He's just been good or solid or functionally just doing what he needs to do with this, within the system, which is what I'm seeing. Driving more so than necessary. In, well, not more so than necessary, but kind of in an exaggerated way. He's driving at the rim. That's that's functional. That's systematic. That is a purpose that their offense has him doing. He's one of the only ones doing that. So I think it's important, but I think he can also do other things. We've seen his dribble pull-up stuff. It's pretty good. Uh, his three-point shot comes and goes. He, kinda, he can tend to fall in love with it if, if it gets a little uh, out of hand. But otherwise, he's not the o most overly efficient player, but I just believe that... Um, you can you can afford to shift the focus on the offense to him uh, if, if if it's an option, I guess is what I'm saying. A lot of times, and I think the pecking order is consistent to where Jason Tatum takes the most shots, Jalen Brown's probably second, and then one of the other guys is third, maybe White or something like that. I think get, throwing a monkey wrench in that and giving Jalen Brown a bit more looks uh, could, could be a, a decent option for the Celtics somewhere in these playoffs because I just feel like they're a bit, a bit, predictable as it pertains to what you expect to see from whom i know Jalen's driving i know jason tatum's taking the most shots i know marcus smart is looking to facilitate if he's not shooting I, like there's certain things that you just know they're going to do and while you may not be able to stop it if you definitely need, know it's coming you're more likely to have success against it so i think they should throw a couple monkey wrenches in there and i know they will because emo yudok has already proven he can do that when he had uh grant williams launched like what 13 three-point shots in game seven against the bucks i think it was so needless to say monkey wrenches are coming um so <clears throat> Derek white Derek white has been pretty good in these finals but in the last game he kind of took some steps backwards on the offensive end his defensive stats were really good so you can clearly see he too like jason tatum is finding ways to help his team in other areas a couple blocks i thought that was impressive however four for 16 mm -mm. Derek white is at his worst for that team when he's bricking shots as I told you guys in one of the videos I made recently, when I was working the Boston Celtics into the equation throughout these playoffs, I was counting on him struggling just about every night. Now, that doesn't mean I don't think he's a really good player because I know he is. I know he is. It's not even a question about that. But the point is, he had been very, very, very inconsistent throughout these playoffs and it started to pick it up over the last several games since since coming back from, from, from his time away. So at this point, I'm looking for him to see if the last game was an out was a... Uh, anomaly or i'm not sure the word if that was just something that you can expect maybe once and only in these playoffs and he's back to being his normal san antonio self or he's going to revert back to his struggling side and that's going to be real bad for the celtics for the rest of the series so him he's very important it's almost like how i look at spencer dinwiddie with the dallas mavericks if that if Derek white is playing well boston celtics are more likely to win their game um you know especially if everybody else is playing average if he's playing above average he, he's he's enough to put you over the top um robert williams we've talked a lot about robert williams health everybody has his interior defense is still solid i think it's overstated his ineffectiveness his health is one thing yes and like i always say i want the williams guys to crash the boards a lot more than they do that part drives me crazy about those two but overall they're still two of the best interior defensive players the game has right now and you're gonna have to understand that as long <clears throat> as Robert Williams is down there, he's going to affect the interior scoring of the Boston Celtics. And as we know, 
rebounding and interior scoring is the meat and potatoes of the Boston Celtics. Along, I mean, excuse me, the Golden State Warriors. Along with the Celtics needing not to turn the ball over, I also do believe that it's very important they take care of that as well. So, all in all, if I'm looking at the Boston Celtics and the, and the Golden State Warriors tonight, I say this shift, this series shifting back to Boston. In most situations, you say Boston Celtics are the team the favorite to win the game. However, these playoffs have shown us something very unique. And what it's shown us is that the Boston Celtics actually do not play well at home this year in these playoffs. Not as well as they play on the road generally these days. I don't know if that carries over in the finals. I, I don't think so. I'm not going to lie to you. I don't think that carries over into the finals necessarily. To assume that they're going to struggle in their building because it's their building, I'm not doing that today. I'm not doing that. If they struggle in their building, it's going to be because the Golden State Warriors effectively beat them on the basketball floor. I think, I believe, I personally believe the narrative of the Boston Celtics being afraid of their own fans is crazy. That's nuts. And I'm going to tell you why. Could the pressure be a lot in terms of wanting to be, bring this team their, seventh, their 18th championship? Of course. Yes. But there's something to be said for being in a building over 50 times in professional settings, not to mention practice. They know their floor very, very well. Most of the guys on this team have been on this team for multiple years. Whatever the pressure is that they're feeling to bring a championship to this team is the same pressure they felt every single day for their entire careers. Marcus Smart, <laughs> Jason Tatum, uh, Jalen Brown, Robert Williams, Grant Williams, all of those guys were drafted with the Celtics. The notion that they are terrified of playing in their own gym is disrespectful. It's, just, it's disrespectful. I'm sorry, I'm not doing it. Have they struggled in their building? Yes, the numbers tell us they've struggled. Have they also gone up against some worthy teams when doing so? Absolutely. Teams that can win on the road. The Miami Heat can win on the road. The, the, the Milwaukee Bucks won a championship last year. There is no shame in losing games to those teams in the playoffs at home. Not to mention, they knocked those teams off. That's why they're here now. So, far be it for me to defend the Boston Celtics in any way, shape, or form. But, that's ridiculous. Jason Tatum is not afraid of his fans. Marcus Smart's not afraid of his fans. Jalen Brown's not afraid of his fans, etc. Nobody's afraid of the team's fans that root for them and that want them to succeed. I'm just not buying it. Now, has there been static in Boston with certain players? Of course. Kyrie's illustrated that he's had his issues. Certain players in the past have illustrated their issues. I remember seeing documentaries on the 80s games. There were issues with the fans and the players. However, it's 2022. They're in the finals. They're excited about being there. They have a team good enough to win. And I don't think the Boston Celtics fans look at the Golden State Warriors as some pushover. There's no shame in losing a damn series to the Golden State Warriors in the finals. Are you kidding me? You think the Boston Celtics are going to bash their team, arguably the best defensive team we've seen in seven, eight years, because they weren't able to overcome the current dynasty? Nah. No, I, don't think, I don't think Boston Celtics fans are going to crush their team for not beating Steph Curry in the dang finals. Okay? So we're going we're gonna to get rid of that narrative here. We're going to get rid of that. <clears throat> I just don't believe that. That doesn't mean that the Celtics are going to win this game or even the next game, but that does mean that – I do not feed into the narrative. Simple as that. All right. So now that we got that out the way. I want to get back to Marcus Smart because he really disappeared in game two. And that cannot, cannot take place again. There will be no games that the Boston Celtics win where Marcus Smart plays like that. Doesn't happen. Can't happen. They need him to do more than have five assists, five turnovers, two points, that's not Marcus Smart. I don't know who that was, but it wasn't Marcus Smart. And when you start looking at the battles that the Boston Celtics have gone through, you start looking at the, the rigors of playing two seven-game series, you understand that this team is tired. I'm just going to tell you all the truth. The Boston Celtics are a tired franchise, and I don't know. I honestly don't know that those two days off did them any good because when you consider the game ends – and then they got to get ready to get on a flight. And then when they do the flight thing, they got to do the media day thing. And then the media day thing next up is game day. Today's already back around. So I'm not certain Robert Williams, Marcus Smart, and those guys who needed that rest really actually got that rest after one of the longest flights the NBA has to offer between Golden State 
in Boston. So I'm still worried about the Boston Celtics' ability to keep up with the Golden State Warriors as it pertains to fatigue right here and now. I think they were really, really tired in fourth quarter of the last game, or rather third quarter, and third quarter was really what it was. Um, and they just didn't have anything in the tank for themselves. The great players that we've seen play well all playoffs long just literally didn't have anything in that third quarter, and it, and it showed. Um, so it's about rest, rest for the Boston Celtics. We know what they can do when they're healthy, but unfortunately, I just think they're exhausted and they're going to stay that way. They're going to stay that way. So they're going to have to rely on their bench a little more. Um, I think maybe try to buy themselves some time. I, I wouldn't be against maybe sitting one of those guys tonight. Just buy yourself some time because at the end of the day, it's not a <clears> – <throat> I'm not going to say this is a throwaway game in the series. But what I will say is, in my opinion, this is the least most important game in the series, which is game three when you split after – after the uh, after the home team won, after the home team lost the second game, now you're headed back to your house. You got house money. Worst thing that can happen is you lose this game. You go down two one. You got another game in your house to tie it up. Best case scenario, you win this game. You're up two one, and even have more of a cushion to do what it is that you need to do. This is the game where you can say, "I can do that." Because if for some reason you don't do it in this game, you try to do it in game four. Regardless of what the situation is, now you experimenting or you're, 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 you're doing, you're playing games with the ability to either go down 3-1 or tie the series up 2-2. And that's, that's not a circumstance you want to toy with. I would much rather toy with a 1-1 series, seeing what happens with game three. So if I'm the Celtics, I'm resting some, maybe considering resting some people, maybe not fully sitting them, but definitely scaling back their minutes quite a bit. Um, so we'll see what happens. Maybe more Peyton Pritchard tonight. Maybe we actually see Aaron Naismith get some real rotation minutes tonight since he's looked so good with the, with the garbage time that he's been given. I don't think it would be a bad idea to see what he can do in a couple extra two second quarter minutes, something like that. I think it's a good idea. Uh, what else? Jordan Poole. Okay, so Jordan Poole had a good game from behind the arc, all right? But his overall efficiency wasn't, wasn't all that great. I think his trajectory is headed upwards, but I also think that he's a little bit light in the back pocket dealing with some of those defensive wings the Boston Celtics have. So his struggles could continue, especially headed back on the road. <clears throat> but it was good to see him have a good couple shots fall in game two. Maybe that can kind of get him going for the rest of this series because he's been a no-show pretty much for almost, what, two series now? <clears throat> he's got to get back to who he was when he was balling out of control before the elbow injury, which happened in like the first series or something. So it's been a long time. He should be fully, completely healed from that. <clears throat> and I think we're starting to see him ramp it back up and hopefully Steve Kerr will uh, find ways of putting him in the game and using him properly because, like I said, he's been getting bumped around a lot. They're doing a good job against him. Uh, Kavon Looney, 6-for-6, six six, 7 rebounds. Not an overly crazy stat night, but he was still really, really, really impactful in Game 2, unlike Game 1 where he was not himself. So uh, I think a lot of what Golden State Warriors uh, can do is, is on him right now. Because he's their best rebounder, and as we know, that's what I believe is going to get it done. As long as he's getting his offensive rebounds, pushing people around, and defending the way that he's been doing these last couple series, um, this 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 is what it is. The Golden State Warriors going to win the championship. I call him the trump card. He was the trump card in the last series because there was absolutely no answer for him against Dallas. I'm not sure that's necessarily the case here against Boston, but what I can say is if he continues to play the way he did in game two, uh, Golden State's going to love what comes out of the circumstance. Draymond Green continuing to uh, att attack the rim. Uh, you know, I think that's a very important thing. He got two really, really key, easy layups in the game um, in situations where they weren't necessarily guarding him properly. So as long as he remains willing to do those things, remains willing to shoot the three-point shot that they leave him open for, um, I think he's, he he can he can occupy enough space to operate. But as long as he doesn't do those things, uh, he will be given too much space to operate, which which also means that other guys are getting crowded. That's what I'm trying to convey to you guys. Um, he will be left alone. The other guys who he needs to get the ball to to score, they get crowded out. So it's on him to continue to be a threat scoring the basketball, particularly driving at the rim and hitting his free throws be better there. 
Um, he's one of the big, great defensive players, um, obviously. So his defense has been stellar all playoffs long. You know that. He's going to bring it tonight as well. Obviously, much has been said about him and Jalen Brown getting into it. I didn't talk about that at all. It just didn't catch my radar, to be honest with you. Some stuff is like, in my mind, it's like, it's what you talk about when you don't think people are interested in the X's and O's of basketball. That's what that is. That's literally all that is to me because I thought it was a non-factor. Draymond didn't get thrown out of the game. Jalen Brown, those guys weren't about to fight, man. They, they're fighting for a championship, and if it came to that, I'm sure they'll battle for that, but there's no beef. And dudes can be on each other's podcast two weeks from now after the series, so I'm not worried about that at all. I just think it's the heat of the moment, heat of the battle, and I think those guys know what it is they're here for. I mean, I think they know what they're here for. I think they know what their responsibilities is. As Draymond Green said, he's meeting force with force. That's his job. Because if you look at the rest of that team, ain't nobody else going to meet force. Let's just be honest. Who else is going to do something over there on the Golden State side? Those guys are, are, are great guys. They're not forcers. They're not enforcers. Draymond's the enforcer on that team, and so he needs to be able to do that. And like he said, if he's always worried about getting thrown out the game, he's going to play soft. He ain't going to give him that Draymond experience, and he's not going to be able to make up for it in other areas because that's not his game. If he's not being an enforcer, he's not doing anything. What, you want him to shoot threes? Come on, man. Stop playing. So I think the, the officiate, official, officials got it right. You don't throw him out in that situation because he's got it under control, in my opinion. Even though he's been in situations where he didn't have it under control, this is, what, 10 years after the kick in the balls? I think he has it under control. I really do. So if he proves me wrong, we'll talk about it. But... I felt like he was balanced even when he was he was acting out. I thought he was under control. So I think the referee sensed that as well, and there was no issue. Um, so that's all I have to say about that. I don't think it's a thing. But because of that situation, as mentioned on ESPN, I don't remember who said it, but the officials probably was windy once again, uh, wind horse. You will definitely pay attention to the officiating tonight because of it. Um, from what I understand, I think it was wind horse who said this. Scott Foster will be doing the game tonight, I believe, in um, – you know, Scott Foster is a guy who, who's known for making his presence felt in the NBA Finals, who's known for calling technicals, who's known for not letting a whole lot slide. So, uh, yeah, keep an eye open for the officiating tonight. I have a feeling it's going to be a big deal. All right. So, what have I talked about? This is a lot. Uh, Al Horford. Al Horford has been great. His three-point shot was falling in game two, if I'm not mistaken. I wish I would have looked at his stats beforehand, but... Um, you know Al Horford's a man. You, you know that. I've been telling y'all he's a Hall of Famer. This is not a game. It's just about him winning this this championship and solidifying it. And um, it's one of those situations where maybe he does it, maybe he doesn't. I don't have him winning the series, but he's been phenomenal throughout these entire series. And his three-point shot is really, really, really key for the Boston Celtics. Obviously, his defense is key. Obviously, his rebounding is key. Obviously, his energy and offsetting that force with force, he's, he's that's one of his, his roles as well along with Robert Williams, and Grant Williams, and Marcus Smart. You see, Boston Celtics have so many enforcers. It's really Andre to, like, literally be that guy. He's only one. So, with that being said, getting back to it, I think it's very important that Al Horford continue to shoot that three ball and let it fall, let it fly. Uh, because at the end of the day, we do respect the Golden State Warriors bigs can get out to the three-point line, but you don't want to, if you're them, you don't want to have to keep doing it. You don't want to have to keep having Kevon Looney try to rush out there. You don't want to have Draymond Green continuing to rush out to the three-point line. That's annoying. And most importantly, it worked for Dallas. It worked for Dallas. When they shot that three ball in the only game that they won, I think it was game four, they were able to effectively remove Kevon Looney from the series, that game, that particular game. So if the Boston Celtics are looking for something that has worked in the past, shooting the three ball and hitting it at a very high clip, like they did in game one, shooting over 50%, is definitely the successful way to go. Uh, the Boston Celtics, the Golden State Warriors need to per, uh, defend the perimeter a bit better. I think they did a great job of that in game two. So we'll see if that carries over into game three. Uh, but game one, that's when Boston was really hitting that three. So, you know, we'll have to see. That's the thing. Golden State Warriors run hot and cold, man. They run hot and cold. As much as we respect the Golden State Warriors, they have shown us in this series that they can win big. And they can f lose big. They can find themselves getting blown out, you know what I mean, at any given moment. So I wouldn't be surprised if that's what we see tonight, to be completely honest with you. So with all that being said, Boston Celtics are headed back home. Coming off a loss. I think the Boston Celtics are going to take tonight's game. I do. I'm going to pick the Celtics to win game three. It's in their house. 
a lot has been said about how poorly they've played at home. And I think they're going to shake that off. I think they're going to come in with a certain level of intent in regards to making sure that that is not the case tonight. Um, the Golden State Warriors getting off a flight. They're now playing on the road in Boston. They ain't had a flight this long in a, in a while. Um, you know what I mean? I think Boston's been waiting to get back home for home cooking. I think they're ready to see their fans again. I think Jason Tatum's ready to put on his white jersey and we'll see that green around him. Um, that kind of thing. And I just feel like this is a game where you can you can feel pretty confident that Emma Udoka is going to see something that worked in game two and make an amazing adjustment in game three because that's what the history of this playoffs has shown us. He makes ridiculously successful adjustments. So that's what I expect him to do tonight. I think the Boston Celtics are going to take game three in their house. Um, yeah, yeah. I expect Marcus Smart to play better if he's healthy. If he's healthy enough to do it, I think so. Although I have my questions about the rest being good for the for the Boston Celtics being enough. I also have my questions about the rest and the flight being a, being a, a, a little bit of frustrating uh, for the for the for the Golden State Warriors. So the Warriors are the older team. The Warriors are the team that's having the rotation switch up switcheroos um, on the road. And overall, I just look at the Clay Thompson inefic inefficiency, the Jordan Poole inefficiency. Uh, just about the inefficiency of everybody since these two games have been so polar opposite that I just am not certain if I really want to just assume that the Golden State Warriors have found something that worked and that it's going to carry over into this game. I'm not thinking that at all, especially since the Boston Celtics didn't have to play any of their starters in the fourth quarter of this previous game. That was extra rest that I think was key for them that will carry over into this game. So if I'm to assume Boston got enough rest, and mind you, history has shown me that they don't need a lot, believe it or not, given the fact that they had a situation where they looked so poor in one game in the Miami Heat series and they came back and looked great in the next game in the Miami Heat series. So if I'm to assume they bounce back very strong from all of that, then you know they'll be ready. The Boston Celtics building will be jumping. And Golden State's going to have their, their, uh, their, their work cut out for them tonight. <laughs> so that's what I'm going to say. Boston's going to get a 2-1 lead on this series, and then we'll go from there. My prediction still stands Golden State in seven. I'm not switching that. But, uh, yeah, yeah. Boston's going to get their, their pound of flesh. I do think they'll win some games at home in this series. So this is the one I think they'll get. BDF 44, I'm all done talking about this series for now. But, of course, I'll get back to you guys when this game is over. BDF 44, peace.